Thank you guys for coming out post cookies. I love cookies, so it would be even hard for me to show up to one of these post cookies. Um, so this is Surviving Support, 10 Tips for Saving Your Users and Yourself. And let's get to it. So my name is Julie Cameron. You can find me at Jewel of the Lotus on pretty much all of the social networks. Um, just a little background about me. I'm a front-end developer for Articulate. It's an entirely remote company. We've got about 150 people, no central office at all. Um, so it's a pretty interesting dynamic. If anyone's interested in talking about remote or looking at some options, we do have a couple positions open right now. And we are starting to get into open source, which is really cool. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Girl Develop at Ann Arbor. And we are just getting off the ground. We launched in June, and we're picking up pace pretty steadily. So if you're interested in creating diversity and want to know more about the group and kind of where we're located, it's a national organization, talk to me. And then lastly, what sort of brings me here today is that I'm an open source developer. Um, so let's talk about this a little bit more. At my last company, I created this thing called Slick Quiz. Um, now this was for kind of 80, 20 time at the company. We had about six hours a day to work on a project. And for whatever reason, I don't even recall at this point, I decided it would be cool to make a jQuery quiz plugin. So this went really well. So well that the company was like, hey, can we use this plugin in our custom CMS? And they wanted to be able to create and manage quizzes via their CMS. So I'm like, OK, well, I'm going to have to build a back end for it now. Well, that worked out well. And then they were like, hey, can we use this in WordPress? I'm like, all right, let me make a WordPress plugin now. So fortunately, because we had started this 80-20 thing recently, um, the company was interested in getting into open source. And they agreed to make this uh, pretty much the first project that got open source for the company. Um, so it was obviously new ground for everyone. We didn't have much experience uh, with how things would work or, or anything like that. So launching an open source tool was really easy. You know, git push origin master. But then, sorry, my mouse is on the wrong screen now. But then tech support happened. <laughs> And you know, with all of the excitement of going open source, we hadn't even really considered the post push process of the, of the tool. Um, so we kind of got hit hard. And by we, I mostly mean me, because <laughs> I was the only one really supporting this. Um, but you know, we kind of had that uh, ideal mentality that like this is open source. Other people are going to help us. They're just going to fix our problems for us. And you know, we, we discovered pretty quickly that that doesn't really happen. Um, so the onslaught of support requests sort of started coming in pretty quickly. And for Slick Quiz, they came in from all directions. So blog comments, because it was a WordPress plugin, I had it on the WordPress plugin page. Um, so we had our own support threads there. GitHub issues on both the jQuery and the WordPress uh, repositories. Stack Overflow post. People were asking me questions on Twitter. Like, I can't give you a 140 character response. <laughs> and then I was even getting people searching out my email address, my personal email address, and asking me questions that way. So these things sort of just started coming in from all directions at all hours of the day. And it quickly became overwhelming. Um, so for me, there were sort of three core areas of, of challenge and challenges with support. The first one was that I had two versions of the plugin. They were called the same thing, basically. You know, one was just Slick Quiz, one was Slick Quiz WordPress. Um, but there was a lot of confusion between the users. You know, where do I comment to get support? I had these two blog posts up. One was for jQuery and one was for WordPress, and I would get complete cross commenting on them. So for me personally, it became really difficult to just keep these things separated and clear in my head what was going on. Um, and I think, obviously, the users were probably confused, too. The second issue that I came across was just a lot of repetition with the questions and responses, um, especially in like the WordPress support forum. I was kind of hoping that you know, I could answer a question, and then if someone else had the same question, they would look through the forum before creating a new post. It doesn't happen. Users are kind of lazy, it turns out. Um, so it became very repetitive, which ended up eating up a lot of time. Um, and that leads to the third one, which is that with all of the answering questions and repetitiveness of these and trying to figure out what's coming from where and what relates to what, 
Um, I was starting to spend more time providing support than I was creating new features for the tool, um, which was something I obviously wasn't happy about. Um, so these, I think, apply mostly to Slick Quiz, but there's probably a little bit of overlap in general with projects that are open source. Um, but in, more, in general, sort of the challenges of good support, and I highlight good here because virtually anyone can do bad support. That's really easy. Um, but I think the first one is organization. Obviously, if, if you've got requests coming in from all directions, you've got to remember to go look in this place for something and go look in that place for something else. And that eats up time on its own um, and obviously pulls your mind in many different directions. Um, time and resources, we talked about this a lot. If you don't have that organization, you're going to spend a lot of time just looking for stuff, which really doesn't help. Um, communication, I think, is the third challenge. And especially with WordPress and probably with kind of more general open source projects, you've got people from all over the world using your tools, right? So you might get very fractured English in your, in your uh, questions. And sometimes that's hard to translate. Or this goes into the second thing. You might have users who perceive something entirely different from what the actual issue is. Um, so Scott Birkin, who wrote The Year Without Pants, called perception the biggest wild card of support. And I think that's totally true, because what might actually be happening is generally often not how the user sees it. So just working through that perception and extracting the actual problem from the user can be a big challenge as well. You might have a lot of back and forth there. And the last one, which I think is probably about as challenging as perception, is empathy. So we've probably all had these very frustrated calls to, say, Comcast or whoever your internet service provider is in Portland. Um, but we all know it can get very frustrating on both sides, not just for the user who's experienced the, tr the trouble, but also for the support provider. You know, As a support provider, you've got to deal with the unhappy user. There's only so much you can do. You probably have limited knowledge, so you have to reach out to other people too. But it can become very frustrating on both sides. The benefits of good support, though, the big one is happy users. Um, so when you fix a bug, or add a requested feature for a user, they're probably going to be happier with your project than they would have if they never experienced any issue at all. You've now personally helped them and made their life better by doing what you did. Um, and that's going to lead to reviews. You might get a five-star review just for helping someone. right? And increased reviews are going to give you increased exposure. More people are going to find your product. Maybe someone blogged about it, and now you've got a whole bunch of people coming to check it out. So that increased exposure is going to get you higher adoptants. Also awesome. And ultimately, sort of unrelated to this flow of awesomeness, is that if you can set up a good support system, you're going to save yourself time and money. Um, it might not feel like it initially, but as you keep building onto the support system, it becomes easier and easier to start dealing with these issues. So with that, let's get into my 10 tips for saving your users and yourself. And I by no means have successfully implemented it, all of these 100%, but you know, it, it took enough just to identify them and I'm kind of building onto them as I go, which I think is probably gonna be the case for most of you. So tip <laughs> one, kind of a giveaway, actually provide support, right? So the benefits of providing support are kind of obvious now. Um, but kind of a key to this is you can really only provide good support if you act fast, right? And ideally within 24 hours, maybe two days. Um, but the more quickly you can respond to users, the better. The happier they'll be, the more uh, agreeable they'll be in working with you. That said, acting too fast can create lazy users. So if all of your users start to recognize that, oh, if I go post on a GitHub issue right now, she's going to reply to me in like five minutes. I don't need to Google this. She'll just give me the answer. right? So people will start to pick up on that if they're very regular in asking you questions. Um, so respond quickly, but don't get in the habit of kind of jumping on things as soon as they come in. Um, that's going to cost you a lot of time and eat into your probably work life as well. <laughs> um, 
And you also don't want to put off support until after launching the product, right? So don't launch it and then wait two, three months to start getting into support because you're going to have a huge backlog. It's going to be very difficult to wade through and organize and address everything at that point. So try to have, you know, when you're working on your next project and you're working on getting out there, think about a plan before you start and just be prepared. Speaking of plans, tip two is to have a plan. And make sure that that plan is clear to your users. So this is about setting clear expectations, um, not just to your users, but to yourself and to your team if you have one. So this is like the who, what, where, when of support. Um, who? Are you personally going to provide support? Do you have a team of developers? Are you hoping other users will provide support? That's something you want to figure out. And once you make that decision, you can kind of steer the rest of your plan to work with that decision as well. So when? Is this going to be 24-7 support? Are you going to have a full-time team out there helping people? Are you maybe going to do this yourself? In which case, maybe twice a day makes sense for you. Maybe you can pick you know, morning when I wake up, before I go to work, evening when I get home. Or maybe you're just going to do this one time a week. Or maybe it's whenever you get a new ticket. Like I said, that might not be the best idea. But once you can figure out this frequency, it's not a bad idea to post somewhere and let your users know that this is how it's going to work. If you're 24-7 support, then totally tell your users that. They're going to love it. If you're only going to look at support requests maybe once a week, maybe put a message somewhere that says, I answer support requests on Fridays. You know, look for an answer then. Um, and maybe give them like an emergency method, but you know, you can think about that one. <laughs> that could get taken advantage of. <laughs> Um, the third piece is what are you going to respond to? So will you answer questions that are only directly related to your library or tool? Or will you answer questions that are very broad and maybe only loosely related? Um, with WordPress plugins especially, I get a lot of questions about, you know, I installed the plugin, it works great, but this button looks really weird. I'm like, well, you know, your, th your theme has specific styles that are interfering with how the plugin looks. So, you know, in that case, I'm a front-end developer. I could answer their question in five minutes. I could go look at their site, figure out where the styles are getting messed up, and then give them a line of CSS to fix it. Um, that's probably going to go over a lot better than me saying, hey, sorry, go research CSS. You know, spend your next few days on that. So in, in my case, I've decided I can kind of help with these fringe things. But if it gets into something like, you know, Maybe there's clearly a server issue. Maybe they're running a really old version of PHP. Like, that's not my domain. I don't have time to explain that. So that's kind of the thing where I'll say, hey, if you have a developer you're working with, talk to them. Have them check out PHP and you know, see what's going on there. So you kind of have to decide what you want to address and what you want to defer. And then lastly, where are users going to submit their tickets? You know, are you going to have a, a standalone ticketing system? Are you going to use GitHub issues? Um, will you be looking at forum posts or blog comments or Stack Overflow? Um, once you can make this decision, if you've got documentation or a web page for your product, make sure you've got messaging there that clearly directs users to those forums so that they're not seeking you out on Twitter or finding your personal email address. Right? So this is all about kind of creating these expectations and funneling your users to the paths that you want them to take. So tip three is to know your product and make sure your users know it too. So this is kind of about being very clear about what your product is and isn't. And to do this, you kind of want to think about a product development guideline. You know, what features are in your future? What features are totally not in your feature? What do you absolutely not want to implement? Because users will ask for everything, right? So in the case of Slick Quiz, it was a basic jQuery quiz plugin. It was very, very cheatable in that all the questions and answers were just stored in a JSON object right there on the page, right? Not meant for academic use. <laughs> but I had a lot of people who were clearly teachers at the college level even who wanted to use the plugin to quiz their students or give their students tests, right? I initially did not want to provide this functionality because that's 
kind of getting into a much more complicated level than I initially in anticipated. Um, but due to the number of requests, I kind of had to change my outlook. And right now I'm looking at implementing those features. One thing that I absolutely will not implement though is a fill in the blank type question. Because right now it's just multiple choice or true and false. If you get into fill in the blanks, you've gotta be concerned about all this other stuff, right? So I've, I've drawn that line there and you need to be prepared to do the same with your projects. Um, and because of that, you need to be prepared to tell your users that their request is out of scope. Of course, you wanna be very polite about it, explain your reasoning why, and usually if you have some sort of alternative, like I consider fill in the blank just multiple choice, but with clearly defined answers, you know, that's an alternative you can give them. It's maybe not perfect, but it might work for them. Um, and lastly, it doesn't hurt to let users know what features you have in the pipe. So if you've got a, a web page or a, a description page or a readme somewhere, maybe at the bottom throw in a list of, you know, these are the features that we're actively working on adding in or would like to add in. Because just having those listed there, if your users see that, they might not bother reaching out to you to ask for it. And be like, oh, they're working on this. If I wait a few months, hopefully it'll be out there. So. Tip four, provide instructions and be very, very, very thorough. This goes back to that communication challenge. So you won't necessarily know who your users are when they reach out to you. So you've gotta be prepared for just about anyone ever. Um, with WordPress especially, you know, everyone's using WordPress. Your grandmother, five-year-olds, tech, you know, people who are familiar with the environment, people who can figure it out. Um, but you've got to be prepared to work with all of those people when they put in requests for you. So to kind of steer some of those off as much as possible, just have very thorough documentation. Um, if, if you have well-organized documentation that it's easy for your users to parse through and read, hopefully that will give them some of the answers that they need and reduce the number of requests that do get through. Um, so organization, comprehensive, clear readmes are very important. Um, if you can, incorporate how-to videos, include screenshots, show the user exactly how to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and if you are maintaining your own forum uh, for support tickets, maybe throw up a message right before the, the form to submit that says, hey, have you checked the documentation? Have you looked at the FAQ page? You might find your answer there. And if you can build a, one of those smart systems that kind of looks at the question that you've asked and then pulls up related responses, that's even better because they might click one of those links before they hit submit, saving you time. So this is really about helping the users help themselves. Tip five, embrace the FAQ and stop repeating yourself. So, when I started repeating my answers over and over and over again through the WordPress support forums, this got very annoying and exhausting. Uh, and one thing that I've discovered has helped, at least for WordPress, is to pull those answers out and stick them in the FAQ. Even if I get the same question again, I don't have to go search through 33 forum posts now. I can go straight through the FAQ, copy and paste that in, or just link them straight to the FAQ. So my kind of rule of thumb is if I get the same question more than once, if I find I need to type that answer out exactly the same more than once, put it in the FAQ. It's obviously not clear enough in your tool how to do this thing. Um, I would also say anticipate the questions that people would ask before they come through support. So really pretend that you're the most basic user possible. You've got the m most minimal experience with this tool and think about the questions that you would have working with it. Or if you can, find someone else who isn't so familiar with the tool and have them use it and just document the questions that they write or that they ask. Um, use those to kind of formulate and put together your FAQ. So make it better. All of these support requests indicate a way to improve your tool especially if you're adding things to an FAQ. That means there's something that's not clear in your product that you could stand to clarify somehow. 
Um, so look for patterns in your support requests. And there are a couple different ways to do this, especially if you've got your own sort of ticketing system, it's really easy to just tag things. Um, you could tag issues on Git, but if you can sort of group these things together and find these patterns, it's really easy then to find a solution. Maybe it's as simple as, simple as adding a couple help labels to your interface. Or maybe you've got to slightly adjust the functionality to make it a little easier to work with for the user. Or maybe it means adding a new feature entirely, because that's what all the requests are coming in for, this new feature that you don't have yet. Um, so there are many ways to address this, but there's always room for an improvement as with every support request that you get. So tip seven is to broadcast your updates. Um, whether it be via a blog, a newsletter, through push notifications, you know, let people know that there's been an update and be very clear about what was included in the update. Um, so you know, keep your change logs really documented. Make sure your commits are very detailed. Um, if you have a blog or a website around your product, post an update that says, hey, this version just went out. It's got X, Y, and Z. Um, people who are really dedicated users to your project will keep an eye on that. And you know, if they see something come in, they're going to keep an eye for that. If they've got an issue that you've said, hey, I'm working on this right now, they'll keep an eye on that and hopefully hear when it comes out. Um, so this includes readmes and FAQs. If you're adding new features or addressing issues that people have had a lot in the past, make sure you update your readme with those new features. Make sure you clear up the FAQ, maybe you can remove that question or modify the response to say, hey, look here for this answer now. Um, so this is all about just increasing documentation for people. This is the hard one. Listen and relax. Just chill out. Uh, don't take frustration and ignorance personally. Um, so support can be really, really, really hard. Users can be panicky, they can be desperate, they can get manipulative and just be plain rude. Um, you've kind of just got to take a step back and put yourself in their shoes, realize that they've got a job to do too. And maybe they're under pressure, maybe they've got a deadline. You've got to do what you can to help them, but sometimes it's not going to work out. Um, so. The best way to kind of get through this, I've found, is to just communicate as clearly as possible and proofread what you're communicating so that you're, you're confident that it's going to make sense to the other user. This goes back to that perception. How are they going to perceive your response? Are they going to, going to interpret, it, interpret it accurately? Are they going to find their answer with what you've given them? Um, so a couple ways to do this, reiterate their problem. Make sure you get it accurately. Um, use clean formatting, paragraphs, bold words, use code blocks, use images and screenshots. Um, the more clearly you can outline your response, the more likely they'll be able to follow it, the more likely they'll see that you're trying to help them and give them a thorough answer. Um, numbered lists for steps are really, really, really helpful. So if you can direct the user through the interface, or through a number of, of steps. Um, if they have an issue, you can say, well, hey, did this happen when you did step two? And you can get much more clear idea of where the issue is happening. Um, and lastly, I'd say use quotes to refer to uh, specific things in the interface or in the tool. Um, so if you've got you know, my, my quiz interface, I've got an add quiz link. If you're going to refer to that link, put it in quotes and use the exact text on the link so that they can see those quotes and say, oh, this is the exact thing that I should be looking for somewhere. Right? So it helps them understand that this is the exact thing. They can find it somewhere. It's going to look exactly like this. Be gracious, personable, and thankful. This is hard, especially if it's been a difficult exchange. Um, but pretty much no matter what, I always try to say, hey, thanks for using FlickQuiz, or thanks for trying it out. Hopefully, we can get it to work out for you um, if you're still running into issues. Um, but ultimately, you have to know when to walk away. 
like I said, people can be manipulative and angry and rude. They can be downright nasty. And sometimes, no matter how nice you are, no matter how thorough and helpful you are, it's going to keep going. And they can become plain abusive, which you shouldn't have to take. You're doing your best to help them. You don't need to deal with that abuse. So sometimes you need, you need to fire the client. You know, tell them straight up, I would love to help you, but this just isn't going to work out. Hope you can find another product. You know, it's hard, but sometimes you have to do it. Tip nine, establish a fan base. So happy users lead to more happy support. They're going to be much more pleasant to interact with if they're happy. Um, so if you can fix a bug for them, if they need to come back for help later on, it's going to be so much better than if, you know, it just didn't work out or if you had a bad exchange. Um, so make support easy. Help them help you help them. Uh, be friendly and thank your users for trying your product. Credit users if they found a bug or if they requested a feature. So in all that documentation and the updates that you push out to your blog or in your readmes or your change logs, say, hey, thanks user X, Y, and Z for finding this bug. Because if they see that, they're going to be like, oh, I made this thing better. I'm contributing. I'm awesome. Yeah, open source. Um, so this can really make users happy just to see that you've helped them, you've fixed their bug, and now all of these other people using your product have that benefit as well. Add the features that they're all asking for. You know, if you've got a handful of people openly requesting the same feature over and over and over on your blog, add it. You might need to change your product guideline. Um, you might need to make an exception. But if that's going to make users happy, you're going to get those reviews. You're going to get that adoptance. It's going to work out. And lastly, I would say check in with your users on occasion especially if you are a bigger organization or have a very popular large product. Um, if you've got some key customers, big corporations or big users, reach out to them on occasion and say, hey, how's it working out for you? Is there anything that doesn't work right? Is there anything that you'd like to see added? You know, have you found any bugs? How's it going? Um, this is going to show them that you care about them. You want to make sure they have the best experience possible. And hopefully, you can get some new ideas of what to improve out of that. And tip 10, be your own user. Eat your own dog food, especially if you're not the developer. Developers tend to have very intimate relationships with the products and the code bases that they write. They know every nook and cranny. They already know where the bugs are. They already know what features aren't there or what features could be improved. So if you're not the developer, use the tool as much as possible. Know where the, the bugs are. Know what things could be improved. And be prepared to talk to people about these things. So I think my final words of wisdom, ultimately, would be treat your users how you'd want to be treated. Thank you. I think we have some time for questions. Uh, you mentioned you're not um, doing all of those to the fullest for this. Um, do you mind talking about which ones you, you think you're struggling with? Sure. Um, I think probably the documentation is the hardest, making sure that with every update that I push out, I'm updating readmes and I'm updating FAQs. I've definitely gotten better with it. Um, it's just something that like tends to slip my mind when I'm like I'm just eager to get the feature out right or to fix the bug. Um, so I've I've made a point to kind of take documentation days where I'll go through all the things that I've pushed out recently, make sure that they're well documented, or look for issues with the documentation, things that could be clearer, and fix those up. Um, let's see what else. That's probably the, the biggest challenge for me. Yeah. Anyone else? So like, there's a lot of different ways that you talked about the people who get in touch with you to try to get support. Do you have any techniques for trying to shepherd them to the preferred, like not emailing through personal emails 
for yeah. that. Yeah, with the WordPress support forum and setup in general, it's pretty easy for them just to go to the fo support forum that's within the plugin. Um, but I do still get people going to Twitter or emailing me. Um, and usually if I get that, I'll say, hey, uh, sorry to hear you're having this problem. Can you post it in the forum? And we can address it there. And if anyone else has had the issue, they'll see it too. So kind of letting them know that you know if you put it in this place, it's going to help everyone out. Um, and you know if I get an email, I'll have a similar response. But it's kind of saying, hey, I'd love to help you. Can you put it here? And we can get it addressed better more quickly. Yeah. All right, thank you.